In the Old Testament time, of course, we understand that the word den could mean many different things, especially in particular to a shepherd. You would understand the concept that they would be involved with and that they would, they would be connected to something totally different from those particular areas that they're looking at. And so as we consider God's work here, consider God's opportunity to be able to show his power, we, we know and sense that God is working in a wonderful way. Thank you, sir. Working in a wonderful way in their lives. And he shows the reality of that to those who would take heed to listen even now under the things of the Lord. So he shows us by his power and his might that he's present and he has power and he's able to change the lives of individuals and his servants. So in the Old Testament time, the dens and the caves were used for different avenues and things in the book of Judges in particular. And uh, you're going to find and understand that when the Midianites came against the people of God, they hid in the dens and the caves under Gideon. We know they were hiding out there. It was a place of protection, a place to be involved, but they couldn't be in the open anymore because they were being oppressed by the Midianites. Many times we can talk about a den or a cave or something of that sort. When you talk about dens in, Di in the book of Daniel, it talks about Daniel in a den of lions. So it's an enclosure where he's wrapped up in the aspect of the shelter where the lions are. And sometimes it's a place of security. Sometimes it's not a place of security, but it is a den. When I grew up, of course, in our house, we uh, had a small house and we had a family of eight. And so my dad would build on rooms or do different things to make it more obvious had a back porch and he converted the back porch into a place where you could sleep or be involved with. We understand that there's private places and secret places that you have. And of course, I'm so old, we didn't have indoor plumbing for a long period of time. And we took a bath in a number two wash tub. And so, yeah, way back. And you understand that there, you had the water out all day long, the sun was shining upon it. And so you got your bath long before it got dark, amen. If you want any warm water at all. Now, some of you cannot remember this, but there used to be phones that had cords. <laughs> a lot of things in our world have changed. I thank the Lord for inside plumbing, amen? I thank the Lord for the opportunity to see things go forward for the cause of the Lord. So in our day that we lived in, a den at my grandma and grandpa's house was an extra room that there was a library in where you could study and read and prepare in what they called the den. There'd be some privacy that you have connection with, and they go into that room. And so whether it's a cave or whether it's a shelter in a room or whether it's another room set aside, I believe every one of us in this room tonight ought to have a place to pray. Jesus talks about the prayer closet. It may be a literal closet. It may not be a literal closet, but it should be a place to pray. Maybe it's on your back porch. Maybe it's in a private room. You understand. I hope you understand tonight that everyone in this room needs to have a time and a place to commune with God. Daniel went back to his room. He opened his windows toward the temple and toward the place of God. And he cried out to God at least three times a day. And he communed with the Lord. And so I just want to remind us that we have not because we ask not. And the opportunity is given to us to pray. Even Jesus Christ himself said, pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. And then he trained the 12 and they went out and did the same thing that Jesus was doing. And the Bible said in John 17, he also wants us to know that God is praying, Jesus was praying for those that not only would get saved, but those that would get saved hearing the word of the other apostles as they were sent out as well. And here we are many years later, still proclaiming the same message, not the original disciples, but the same message is being permeated around the world. Aren't you glad someone told you? You prayed unto God, God forgave you of your sins, and now you know you're part of the family of God. So here we find Daniel trying to understand why are we in this situation we're in? Why are we in these troubles? He knew and he understood, friends. He knew that the people of God were not living for the Lord. They had violated God's word. And be sure your sin will find you out. And there's always consequences for your sin. Mom and dad may not know. Others may not know. But God knows the heart of every individual here tonight. He knows every concern, every heartache, every sorrow, every need that you have. He understands exactly what is going on. As we think about this passage of scripture, it relates to us some ideas about communing with God. Back when I pastored in Georgia, I had the privilege to uh, have a Christian school and, and we took some of the young people from Christian schools on field trips. One of the field trips that we went on was to Walton Clothiers down there in, in, in the south part of Georgia. Uh, they made Kuppenheimer shirts and different shirts for different companies. And they had this great big giant bolt of cloth and they were able electronically to be able to cut out a 48 jacket, a 46 jacket, a shirt, a pair of pants or whatever. And they were able to cut all these things without wasting any, anything on the pattern. And they cut all these things out. 
all electronically given. And so we were taking a field trip and they were showing us exactly what was going on. It was exciting to see the field trip. And they said, I want to take you one other place. And so he opened the, opened the hallway and went down this hallway and you couldn't hear anything. So quiet, so quiet. It seemed like, does anybody work here? It's pretty quiet compared to the factory. Pretty quiet compared to the and all the sewing and all the stuff that's going on. And I said, what is this? He said, it's the most important room in the factory. I said, how can that be? And he opened the door and it was electrical boxes everywhere. Quiet in the hallway, but the power source were the electric boxes that took care of the whole factory. Do you realize that you and I have a power source? When it comes to prayer, we commune with God through the power of prayer and we have a power source. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. The presence of Almighty God to be able to help us in our time of need. Those electric boxes showed the reality of the communion time. The quiet room at that place was the power room that they had for that factory. And I believe the power we have with God is found in being in his word and being on our face before him. Let's not take for granted we don't need him because without him, we can do nothing. But with him, all things are possible. I understand from reading many books from the days gone by and understanding preaching that's taken place over the years. Charles Spurgeon said this once about prayer. He said, prayer is the slender nerve that moveth the muscles of omnipotence. He said, prayer is the slender nerve that moveth the muscles of omnipotence. God wants to move. God wants to help. John Bunyan said this. He said, prayer is a sincere, sensible, affectionate pouring out of the heart and soul to God. As we pour out our soul to God through Christ, in the strength and assistance of the Holy Spirit, for such things as God has promised, we can have victory in our Lord. Just as certain as breathing is vital to the body, I personally believe that prayer is vital to the soul. Jesus Christ himself in the Gospel of Luke shows his human dependency upon prayer to his heavenly Father. Yes, he was God the Son, but he's also the Son of God. And they had that balance in his life that prayer was vitally important. I'm sure that we could all admit tonight that it's essential that prayer be in our lives. Would you agree? And I also think in my own life that prayer may be lacking in some of the areas I need to be praying. We know that God is able, though, to help us. Daniel scheduled his prayer three times a day. Daniel is probably the greatest prayer warrior we see in the Scripture, excluding Christ, of course, in his earthly ministry. With that in mind, though, we need to have this communion and desire to follow after God. He's constantly our companion, church. We need to commune with him. He speaks to us through his word. We speak to him by way of prayer. In everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. There's also different types of prayer found in the scripture. We're gonna talk about some of those as well tonight. As we consider, what is prayer? I think prayer is basically simply talking with God. We need constant communion with him. Hence, prayer is living before him in his presence, in constant communion with him, being able to commune with him. Communion is developed and enriched and deepened by the communication and prayer of the servant of God, God talking to us and us talking to him. For the sake of this sermon, we'll recognize some of the classifications of the prayer, but mainly deal with intercession, praying on the behalf of someone else. There are many types of prayers in the scripture, prayers of adoration, prayers of praise, thanksgiving, supplications, petitions, imprecation, intercession. There's no doubt that Daniel was a godly man and there's many examples of different types of prayer in his life whenever he was praying unto his God. Turn if you would please back to Daniel chapter number two. Daniel two, we're gonna look at the overview here of the different types of prayer and then we'll get into the context. Daniel chapter number two, he's praying now unto his heavenly father. And in verse 23, here's what he says. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who hast given me wisdom and might, and hast made known unto me now what we desired of thee, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. And so he's giving praise to God. He's asking God for wisdom. God gave him wisdom. He gave him understanding. And he's thanking God for the wisdom. He's praising God. You know, sometimes we get so wrapped up in our own lives, we forget to praise him for who he is, for what he's done. 
Turn, if you would, please, to chapter number six of the book of Daniel, which we were there this morning, for some of you that were in that opportunity. Daniel chapter number six and verse number 13. It mentions again his prayer time. It says, then answered they and said before the king, that Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. He's petitioning God. He's asking God for help. He's asking God for something. You ever done that before? Don't raise your hand. There's times we petition God, isn't there? There's times we praise God, yes. The petition that is being offered is he needs help from God to know what to do in the situation he's in. He needs the wisdom of God. Does he obey the king or does he obey God? What does he do in this time? He gives a petition unto the Lord. Look at chapter six, verse number 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being open in the chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and notice this, and he gave thanks before his God and did a four time. Prayer of thanksgiving. You ever reminded God how much you love him? You ever thanked him for some of the bounty and blessings of your life? We find that David was a man of thanksgiving. A man crying out to the Lord, verse 11. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before God. Understanding that God, to supplicate means to give an earnest request. You cannot tell me, friends, that when he found out he was gonna be thrown into the den of lions, that he was happy about it. He's asking God for help and consideration, seeing what God can do to have an entreaty or a pleading with God. Look at verse 17 of the same chapter, Daniel 6, 17. He explains here, and as the stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den, the king sealed it with his own signet, with the signet of the Lord's, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. The thing, king went into his place and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. And so we know that there are people that are serious about communing with God, but we also know that supplications need to be given for the things of the Lord. Look at chapter nine, if you would, please, of the book of Daniel. And verse number 11, which we read earlier, says, Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written of the law of Moses, the servant of God, because we have sinned against him. So Daniel's praying this prayer. He's praying this prayer about the curse that is on them because of their disobedience to God. And he knows they need help, and there's only one that can help them, God. He's a God of mercy a God of righteousness, a God that is just. He understands he needs help from God. So he cries out. Chapter number nine, verse number three, he talks about his intercession on behalf of the people. I set my face unto the Lord God to seek my prayer and supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Let me ask you a question, church. Do you believe he was serious about praying? Sackcloth and ashes, he understood what was going on. But there's a preamble to this I want you to see. The preamble is verses one and two. Look at verse one and two of chapter nine. In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Now, if you were here earlier this morning, go back to chapter number six, verse number one. Chapter number six of Daniel and verse number one. It pleased Darius to put over the kingdom 120 princes which should be over the whole kingdom and over these three presidents. And so we know we're in the time period, the very first year of Darius the king, he is the Mede and Cyrus is the Persian that the kingdom is now transferred to them. It's his very first year in leadership. And this chapter here in chapter number nine, Daniel is talking about the very same year, the very same year that the king, the one that had him thrown into the den of lions and God brought deliverance, that very same year we find Daniel praying unto his God. Notice verse number one again, the latter part. He said he was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Notice it, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books, plural, the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And when he understood by books about the captivity and how long it was gonna last, he started praying. You say, well, how do you know how long it's going to last? Jeremiah told him. He says right there, I, Daniel, understood by books from Jeremiah the prophet. Keep your place right here and turn back to Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter number 25. Jeremiah chapter 25 and verses 10 and 11. And here's what Jeremiah speaks about God's victory and blessing. 
He said, moreover, I will take from them the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, the sound of the millstones and the light of the candle. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment. And these nations shall serve the king of Babylon. What's it saying those last two words? 70 years. If you study the books of Jeremiah, we find that Jeremiah wrote letters to those that were refugees or the captives that were over there by the river Kibar. And that same book that was written from Jeremiah and the sermons given to them, Daniel got a hold of and Daniel was reading too. And Daniel knew they were in captivity. He knew why they were in captivity. And he says, now I know how long the captivity is gonna last. It's gonna be 70 years. And he's right close to 70 years when he writes this. Flip on over to the passage that Brother Denny used tonight. He didn't know I was going to use it, but Jeremiah chapter number 29, we're going to pick up in verse number 10. I'm going to read through verse number 14 that he read for us three of those verses tonight. Verse number 10, Jeremiah 29. For thus saith the Lord. Who's talking here? Jeremiah is speaking on behalf of the Lord. That after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. He said, I'm Jeremiah, he read Jeremiah. He understood that God made a promise. He's gonna allow them to return to the land. We're gonna find out that Cyrus allows them to do that. But here we find the declaration, verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. He's saying, I don't want you to be in desolation. I don't want you to be far away from me. I want you to be back in the land. That's God's desire, verse number 12. Then shall you call upon me, you shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. You shall seek me and find me, and you shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from the nations, from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. And I will bring you again to the place whence I caused you to be carried away captive. He's making it known that it was because of the judging hand of God, the disobedience of God's people, that they were taken to the Babylonian area, but they had a chance to return. It may seem insignificant as we read this passage, but as soon as Jeremiah understood by books and understood chapter 25 and chapter 29, that's gonna be 70 years, he started praying. You know why? That's what Jeremiah 29 said, said to do. Start praying, yeah. seek God's face. Right. Let me tell you something, friends. If we don't pray, who will? Right. If we don't commune with God, if we don't ask God to help our families, if we don't God to strengthen our church, if we don't ask God to help us in our country, it's not gonna happen, my friends. Right. We need to be faithful to consider God, yeah. crying out with petitions and supplications and opportunity for God to do something wonderful among his people. He knows his thoughts toward us. He loves the world so much he sent his son. Let's remind ourselves of the goodness of God. Amen. That desire that he had to see those things take place. Verse Chapter number nine again, back there if you would, verse number five. We have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled, even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Everything he'd read in Jeremiah, he's now rehearsing with God, saying, God, it is true. We've done wrong. You notice he doesn't talk about everybody else that's done wrong. He said, we have sinned. We've disobeyed God. He put himself right in there. Hey, even the apostle Paul in the book of Romans chapter nine and Romans chapter number 10, it talks about, Paul said, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Amen. Romans chapter number 10, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. They needed the Lord. Just because they were Israelites didn't mean they were right with God. The nation of Israel had wandered from God. They're in Babylonian captivity. They deserve the judging hand of God. But God's not a God of confusion. He's a God of mercy and a God of love. He says, I want you to know I'm thinking good things about you. Cry out to me. I will hear thee. I'll help thee. Amen. The same God that helped Israel. Right. The same God that will help America. Right. Same God that will help your family. Same God that will help your situation tonight and what you're dealing with. Amen. He's the same God that cares for us. Has that concern and desire for us. Back in Daniel chapter number nine, verse number eight. O oh Lord, to us belong confusion of face, to our kings and to our princes, to our fathers, because we've sinned against thee. Listen, it's not that God didn't care. God gave them his word, yet they rejected his word. They turned away from his truth. We know God has great power, church, but we also know the precepts of God tell us how we're supposed to live. 
If we live disobedient to God, then obviously there's going to be the chastening hand of God. Verse number 10. Neither have we obeyed the voice of the Lord our God to walk in his laws while he set before us the servants of prophets. He said, God sent preachers. We rejected the preacher. God sent opportunity. We didn't listen to the preaching. God sent priests. We walked away from them. Verse 11. Yea, all Israel have transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they might not obey thy voice. Therefore, the curse is poured upon us. And the oath that is written in the law of Moses, thy servant of God, because we have sinned against him. Sounds to me like Daniel knew exactly what was going on. And he was very specific when he prayed. Mrs. Pearson, my wife, she'll call me in the office sometime. That she'll be at home and she'll call and she'll say, uh, before you come home, give me a call. I said, okay, and so I'll obey the text and I'll give her a call. She said, you need to go to the store. I said, okay, I'll chat with you later. Now I hang up the phone. I've got some issues with this now, okay? One of my issues would be, what store am I going to? What am I going for? I mean, I don't know if any of you have been sent to the store or not before. I mean, you got to have a list. You got to know what you're going for. Otherwise, you're just looking around. When I go to the store, I'm going on purpose. Now, ladies, don't get upset with me. Don't get upset with me. But when ladies go to the store, they go shopping. And I said before, I think one time I was here and I said, Mrs. Pearson, when we go on a date night, she likes to go shopping. And I like going shopping with her. So we'll go to one store and she'll look at things and we'll go to another store, look at things, another store, look at things. And she says, I'm gonna go back over here. I said, why? She said, better price over there and I like what they had. So we're walking right back to the same place we came from. And she shops. When I go shopping, it's like, I know what size shirt I'm getting. I know what color it is. I know where I'm going. And I walk in and I get it and I don't watch any sales signs or all that stuff that's going on. And I'm on a mission. I'm in and I'm out. Ladies, on the other hand, they peruse, they look around, and they're waiting for the sale. 65% off, 50% off. Obviously, there's a sale going on. And so you want to have advantage of that. But when I go to the grocery store, she tells me exactly what we need on that list. And then I'll come home sometimes and have extra stuff. <laughs> She'll say, what'd you get that for? I said, it was on sale. How much did it cost? I told her, she's like, that's a good buy. I said, well, thank you. <laughs> because if you go shopping, you know what prices are. You want to get a good deal and be a good steward. But the point I'm trying to make here is that she reflects to me the importance of what store to go to and specifically what she wants me to shop for. And so that's what I pick up. Let's not be generic when it comes to prayer works. You've got to, you understand prayer works. You've got that opportunity to call in. You've got that opportunity to, to share your prayer request. You have opportunity to cry out to God. And it's like, well, I have an unspoken request. Well, that's great. We can have some of those. But sometimes we need to be more specific. We need to praise God with thanksgiving. Right. Has he been good to you or not this year? Amen. Has he blessed you in some way? Amen. Have you thanked him for the goodness of God? Have you seen the hand of God working? Daniel at this time is focused mainly on the people of God who've wandered away from him and he realizes and he knows that God's a God of mercy, a God of forgiveness. He says, God, we have sinned. We have done wrong. God, we deserve your judgment. Our face is confused. We need to make sure we follow after you. It's important, God, to hear your word and to do what you want us to do as a servant of God. He was desirous of that. All leaders are guilty from time to time of doing things contrary to what God declares. He goes on to say down in the latter part of the verse, verse number 13, as it is written in the law of Moses, all this evil has come upon us, yet made we not our prayer before the Lord our God. We might turn from our iniquities and understand thy truth. You know, you know we, live in a, we live in a world today that doesn't want to talk about sin. We all do it, but we want to kind of compromise the idea of sin. Well, you know, it's just a mistake, just a small issue, just a problem, just hypertension just a little disobedience. God calls a lot of those things in our lives true sin and iniquity, immorality and such like. Look at you at verse 16. O Lord, according to all thy righteousness, I beseech thee, let thine anger and thy fury be turned away from the city of Jerusalem. Does that sound specific to you? He's asking God to do something, saying, God, take away all these issues. To me, that's a petition being very specific, communing with God and talking with God. And God specifically will give an answer. Verse 17, now therefore, O our God, hear the prayer of thy servant and his supplications. Cause thy face to shine upon thy sanctuary that is desolate, not for my sake, but for the Lord's sake. 
There should not be a reproach and a shame upon the things of God. Jerusalem had a name that they lived. They had their temple. Now it's destroyed. Nobody's there. Jeremiah's trying to preach. They're scattered everywhere. They're saying this is a shame and a mockery to the name of God. Stand up for righteousness. And so Daniel says, I'll do that. So he cries out to God on behalf of all the others. You know, it's amazing how one person can make a difference. Daniel prayed and God began to work. God encouraged Daniel, gave him wisdom and understanding in the things that would take place in the future. Even Gabriel came and touched him and gave him wisdom and insight. Now, in the New Testament time, we all have God in us. We're saved. Christ, the Holy Spirit, lives in us. We are led by the Spirit of God. And may I remind us again, church, that what God leads us to do is not contrary to his written word. He will always tell us how we're supposed to live. And what we're supposed to do and to follow after that righteousness. I'm sure tonight as we look at this, we understand that they were in a heap of trouble, were they not? And specifically, he prayed and asked God for things in his life. When's the last time that you specifically prayed and asked God for something? Not just asking continually, but having a petition, a supplication, and intercession. He's praying on behalf of other people. That's what we do when when we intercede for someone. Even right now, the Bible says that Christ is in heaven interceding for us praying for you and I. He knows his thoughts toward us. Peace and victory. Verse 18. Oh my God, incline thine ear and hear. Open thine eyes and behold our desolations and the city which is called by thy name. For we do not present our supplications before thee for our righteousnesses, but for thy great mercies. God, the only hope we have is you. We've walked away from you. We've rejected the preachers and the prophets. We've turned away from all those things. But God, we know that you can answer. We know that you can help. We know that you can be with us and encourage us. So he cries out to God and specifically prays in intercession for the people of God. Verse 19, O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, hearken and do. Defer, don't put it off. He said, for thine own sake, O my God, for thy city and thy people are called by thy name. He said, oh God, I need your help. God, I need you to direct us. I need wisdom and understanding to live for God and to serve him. Hey, listen, the same year, the same year he was thrown into the den of lions is the same year we're talking about right here. He read the book of Jeremiah. He saw chapter 25 and chapter 29. He knew that God loved him, that God loved the nation. And so he said, if they'll call out to me and they'll cry out to me, I'll hear from heaven. He did exactly what God wanted him to do. Your pastor preaches from his passion of heart, desirous of giving you the truth of God. I wish I could allow you to to be uh, opportunity wise to be able to come in here and say, all right, we have spiritual vitamins for your soul. You come on in spiritual vitamins, this one right here, this is all your supplications taken care of. This is all your petitions taken care of. All your intercessions taken care of. We'd have some people wanting to buy them. They would, but really our help comes from the Lord. We can encourage each other. We can pray with each other. We can know that prayer works and we can call in. But my friend, I think that our problem is, is that we're not even really talking to him the way we should. I've been guilty. You know, we cry out to God when we have a big need. We cry out to God when we have an issue. We cry out to God when we have a problem. And those are all well and good. But we find his focus was on intercession because of what the people had gone through at that time. May I ask tonight, what are we praying for? As individuals. As a church, I appreciate Brother Denny praying for his pastor, as well as the, yes, your pastor, praying that God would use him and help him. What great rejoicing it is. You think about this today. Your pastor is preaching in Kansas. Three people got saved and two others being talked to, and you have a part in that. Your missionaries all around the world are proclaiming the gospel of Christ. A hundred and some missionaries plus that you have, God is using them and helping them. You can't go over there yourself, perhaps, or you might go for a trip from time to time. But my friend, the opportunity is God has called them. We're praying for them. God is working in them and through them. And God's doing a work for them. And it's received glory and honor to God and blessings to our account as well. Wouldn't it be great when some of your missionaries, we all get to heaven. And the missionaries, people that saved there would say, thank you for giving to the Lord. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for assisting us and helping us. At our church, at our men's prayer meeting, we have a men's prayer meeting and we talk about the missionaries that we have. And every time we get together, we're praying for the spiritual life of our missionaries, that God would keep them close unto him. We pray for their money, for their support, for their stewardship of their money, that God would bless them and help them. If we have not because we ask not, then we're not even asking. 
But if we know what God can do, let's be willing to do it. We talk about the temptations that they might face all by themselves over in some other foreign country, that God can help them. We talk about praying for their witness for Christ, that God would help them to be a testimony and give courage and boldness to stand up for him. We talk about people that are working with them as team laborers and missionaries and others on the journey. We pray for their family, pray for their children, pray for their finances, for safety and health and needs that they have. Simplistic, yes, but important as well. Knowing that God will take care of their needs the way he desires to do it. Here we find the prayer life of Daniel was brought to reality because he was humbling his heart in the sight of God. The chapter goes on to tell us in verses 24 to the end of the chapter that he got more than he prayed for. He prayed for the deliverance of the people of God, but God gave him wisdom and understanding through Gabriel to know more about the end times, the nation of Israel, the immediate aspect of where he was, and some future events for the nation of Israel as well, that God would bring deliverance. And by the way, he reminded Daniel that Daniel himself would one day stand in victory and be rewarded for his faithfulness to God. Go to chapter number 12, if you would. Chapter number 12. And it explains to us here in chapter number 12 the importance of who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it says in uh, verse number eight, and I heard, but I understood not. Then I said, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? He said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now, the words weren't being hidden. The words were actually written down by Daniel. We have them today in what we call the canon of Scripture. So we read in the book of Daniel here that God's got a future for his people. You agree with that? Future for his people. He said, many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly. None of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. And so he explains to them the victory of the Lord. Now, verse 13, but go thou thy way till the end be, for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days. There's a future for Daniel and the nation of Israel. On the journey, there could be heartache and tragedy and turmoil. We can cry out to God, just like he intercedes for us in chapter seven, verse number 25, the book of Hebrews. We understand that when Daniel got alone with God, we don't know if it was always in his room. We don't know if it was morning, noon, and night only. But we do know this, it didn't matter what the issue was. Daniel knew he could commune with God. He knew he could fellowship with him. So he got alone in his den of prayer, in the quiet place, he communed with God. His heart was broken, grieving over the nation of Israel. All they had done wrong and he had added himself in there because he knew that he also was part of the nation of Israel. And yet God gave hope and victory and joy and blessing. Hey friends, do you believe Jesus is coming back? Now, in the book of Daniel, we don't find any record of the church. The church has been supernaturally injected in history, and we're living in the day of grace, in the church age. And it'll be supernaturally ejected when the rapture comes. We'll be in the presence of God. But God also has a plan for the nation of Israel. God will reign over Israel, his son, Jesus Christ, in what is known as the millennial reign. So we find that Daniel is alone with God, praying to God, asking God to help in these areas, thanking him, praising him, intercessions on behalf, petitions given as well. And he said, I want you to know that God can answer those things. Do we pray like Jesus does? His example in John 17, for his disciples and those that would believe on him through his word, we should pray and intercede for the lost continually. Somebody shared Christ with you. Let's pray for the lost. Let's put action to our prayers. Won't be long, we'll have a great celebration of Resurrection Sunday, which we do every Sunday, but in particular, on Easter Sunday, the opportunity to be there, we need to be sensitive to the condition of lost people, lost souls, their concern for salvation. You need to be praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication and thanksgiving unto God, realizing we're to grow in grace and grow in knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we pray, we need to be spirit-filled. When we pray, we need to be led of God, not consumed upon our own lust. When we pray, let Christ dwell in our hearts by faith. When we pray, be rooted and grounded in love. When we pray, be able to comprehend the love of God for your life. Be filled with all the fullness of God in your being. Oh yes, there's gonna be times. There's gonna be times, my friend, we're gonna be dealing with health issues. Many of you perhaps tonight. Financial issues. We're gonna face those things. 
situations of a loss of a loved one. We're going to face that if we haven't already. Things going on in life with our children, good, bad, or otherwise. Things that we deal with. Praying for our families. Concerned about those needs. In our church, we have issues. We have problems from time to time. God wants to direct us and to help us as servants of the Lord. And if we know what is right to do, just as certain as I go to the grocery store and have a list, I can come into the presence of God and take that list to him. Take that concern to him. Take that desire to him because we know he is able to meet our needs. He is able to let that be presented to him, not because of our righteousness, but because of his mercy and grace and love in our times of need. Have you ever had an answered prayer? Sure we have. You'd have more answered prayers if there were more prayers offered. Just stands to reason. It may not always be a yes answer that you're looking for. It might be wait or consider the plan of God. But I want to remind us, God's word will not confuse us. It will help us. Remember the power of God. Remember the time of prayer and be faithful to the Lord. I can tell you story after story and situation after situation, no matter what it might be, financially, physical, spiritual, all those different needs in my life where God delivered time and time and time again. And if God's done that for you, thank him for it. Go to him in prayer. If you have a family issue, take it to God. You have a heart issue, take it to God. Let God take care of it. Daniel said, we have sinned. We need God's help. And God allowed that to take place in his life. And he showed him the answer to his prayer at that time. Do you know, there's many things in my life that I, I can talk to you about. But one in particular I want to share tonight because it's affected my life since 1986. Here I am in 2024. 40 years ago. 40 years ago, I was preaching at a church, pastoring at a church, and I went to a nursing home ministry. The nursing home ministry, uh, two o'clock on a Sunday afternoon, I was preaching the word of God and singing to the Lord, singing to those people. We brought them out and we proclaimed the gospel to them because even people that are mature need the Lord. Sometimes in those places they have no, no relatives left. Sometimes they're there and they have no opportunity to have family out there with them. Sometimes they're all alone. And so we were able to go there and to preach the word of God to them, sing songs unto the Lord. And many of them, of course, they're a little bit older and more mature at the time. And so we sang songs that they would love. Like Andy walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me not I'm, he's, I'm his own. The fight is on. Onward Christian soldiers, victory in Jesus. There's power in the blood. They like to sing those songs. Talk about things about and how God answers prayer and meets their needs. As I was there, I'd continually go on, on Saturday, uh, Sunday afternoons at two o'clock and God would minister. And, and so some of the people would say, Pastor, do you have any prayer requests yourself? And I said, well, God has blessed my family and I have an old car and I need to find another car big enough to take care of my family. And I won't have very much money, but I need to find a good van. I need to find a good van that I can have my family and minister with it with my family. That's what I need. And, and they begin to write the things down, the requests that were down, things like that. And they'd remind me all the time, how, or somebody gets sick, how's your boy doing? How's the church doing? And they're asking you all those questions because they're seriously wanting to know about what God is doing. And so in particular, this, this particular time period, I've received a phone call. Phone call I received reminded me that one of the ladies that was in the nursing home had passed away. Her son asked me if I would consider doing the funeral I said, I thought she was a member of such and such church. He said, unfortunately, pastor, she's been there 12 years and they've never come to see her. He said, you come to see her on Sundays. She considers you her pastor. Would you be willing to do the funeral? I said, yeah, I would. I'll do the funeral. I'll do whatever it needs to be done. I will take care of that. And so it was all arranged. We did the funeral, all things that were done. And after the funeral was over, he gave me a love gift. And he said, I want to show you something, preacher. And he got out his 90-year-old mom's prayer journal. In that prayer journal, it said, my pastor needs a van. I really wasn't her pastor. But her number one prayer request, because we came to see her on Sundays, was my pastor needs a van. And I'm glad she was praying for me. But God was going to do something bigger just so happened that her son owned a car lot. 
I mean, it just so happened. And he said, I want to show you the prayer list, preacher. And he opened up his mom's prayer journal. My pastor needs a van. And he said, I want to answer that prayer for my mother. And I thought, wow, great. And so I went to the car lot looking for a nice used van. And he said, there's the brand new ones right there, preacher. I said, oh, no, 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 no. I, I can't afford one of those. He said, oh, no, don't you worry about it. He said, you pick one of those colors and you start driving it. He said, I'll put a plate on it. We'll insure it. You drive it for a while. And I'm thinking, I was really cautious. Don't get it dirty. Don't eat anything. You know, you know, I went through, you know how you go through, you know, it's not mine. It's not mine. Do all these things. And so that I got that car and I drove it. He'd call me and say, how's it going? I said, doing great. And I said, when do you want it back? He said, well, just keep driving it for a while. Well, Justin, I drove for two years. <laughs> two years I drove that thing. He gave me a call one day. He said, preacher, could you come back in with that van? He said, I want to check the brakes. I want to check everything out on it, make sure it's all okay. I said, okay, great. And I thought, well, that's the end of this. I went to see him and he checked everything out. And he said, preacher, the, there's, these are the newer models right here. Oh, by the way, the van was a Ford Aerostar. Ford Aerostar back in those days. And so uh, whenever I went there, he said, try one of those. So I drove that one for a day or two, and he said, just keep driving it. And so I drove it for two more years. He supplied everything. I'm thinking, this is awesome. God is so good, so gracious. Our children would bow their knee and say, God, thank you for the van you've given to us. Thank you for supplying our need. The Baptist preacher got supplied a need by a lady that was in a nursing home. 1990, he calls me again. He said, preacher, how's that van doing? I said, doing great. He said, I need to check it out again. So he'd do it one more time, 1990. I went in 1990, drove in there, and he said, why don't you find another one out there? We're going to sell this one. We're going to, I said, oh, okay. And he said, find you another one. And so I found another one. It was a Spinnaker Blue, light blue, 1990 Ford Aerostar. I got in my car, went away and it's all brand new again. Of course, the kids are like, that's another one. That's another one. But I thank the Lord he's taking care of us. I never dreamed that somebody would let me drive a van for free. I never understood that at all. But I'm praying to God. He answers her prayer and God meets our need at the same time. Amen. Crying out to the Lord. And then in 1990, I drive it for a couple years. 1992, something happened. My wife's grandpa passed away. When he passed away up in Kentucky, we drove that van up in Kentucky. While we were up there, a church in that neighborhood said, our pastor, we just got a new pastor for our church. Would you be able to fill the pulpit while you're here? I said, absolutely. So I preached for him while I was there. Little did I know at the time period that the pastor they'd voted in two weeks before had already resigned. He'd resigned because God revealed to him in his life there were some things he needed to get right before he became a pastor. And so he looked at me and said, would you consider being our pastor? <laughs> I said, no, I'm not interested. He said, would you pray about it? Still with me now, aren't you? Would you pray about it? So we prayed about it. And in five weeks, there was no doubt in our heart and mind that God was moving us to Trafalgar, Indiana. We moved there. I was get ready to make the move. I thought, well, that's the end of our van. So I took it back over to him. I said, I want you to know that I've appreciated all these years of you taking care of a vehicle for us. And I'm thankful to the Lord for it. And I appreciate your friendship, appreciate all your mom did for us and all you did for us as well. He said, you wait right here, preacher. He called a guy over and he said, take that thing in, change the oil, check the tires, take it all, and, and look it all over. And so he come back about 30 minutes later, we're talking and fellowshipping. He sat down in his office. He said, preacher, sign right here. I'm like, what am I signing for? The title. You need the title if you're going to go out of state. And I said, well, I can't afford this van. He said, I didn't ask you to afford it. I said, well, I can't pay for it. He said, I didn't ask you to pay for it. This is still part of my mom's prayer. And he handed me the title in 1992 to a 1990 Ford Aerostar. Praying and rejoicing. 2004, we're still driving the Ford Aerostar. All those years later. 335,000 miles on it. Brother Sam Davison says, Brother Ed, I don't know what God's doing in your life. He said, but I think God needs you to come to Oklahoma and help us. 
come to Heartland and be with us. Try to help us in the ministry. So I sold that van for $500 to a guy that was a painter. He made it a paint van. My children, that's the only vehicle they ever knew. And you may not believe this, but they literally cried because God had provided it. God kept it running. God prospered us with it. And God met our need. There were times on the way to school, you look and on the floorboard, you could see the ground. <laughs> Rusted out because of the fact of all the snow and ice. Different things going on. But every time the tires were needed, any time the brakes were needed, anytime God looked at that, we drove that car 335,000 miles. All because of a dear lady who prayed for my pastor and her son helped answer that prayer. You may have somebody in your family that needs Jesus. You might be the one to help answer that prayer. Praying and going. You might have financial issues tonight. If God can take care of me and I can give you story after story after story of the truth of God, he can do the same for you. He owns a cattle of a thousand hills. He owns it all. He can help you with that. Physically, he may not take away all those issues, but his grace is there. His love is there. His strength is there. If we have not because we ask not, let's ask God to help us. Ask God to strengthen us. Ask God for that boldness to witness. Ask God for the needs that we have and expect God to start answering prayers. Not because we're trying to blackmail him or gang up on him, because he knows our thoughts toward us. He knows the end that we need to have and he wants us to be blessed. So tonight I thank everybody in this room, young or old, We've got some things we could pray about. Intercession, petitions, thanksgiving, gratitude, whatever it might be. I think God wants to do wonderful things among his people. Most importantly for me is that I want God to bless your home, your life, your family in a wonderful way because God can do it. And this church, the same way that God will enable you financially, strengthen you spiritually, help you to go forward for the cause of the Lord. Souls will be saved. A fruit that would abound to the glory of God. And we're active and we're faithful to the things of God. Because we're praying and God's doing the work, as he said. Amen. And then for our country. Do you love your country enough to pray for it? Well, not just today, but continually consider what God wants to do. Their country was in a heap of trouble. One man prayed and it changed his heart, his attitude, and his life. Others around you may say, I don't care. But God wants to help you and help me. And I think we all, individually, can make a difference. If he supplied me with one, he can help you as well. May God bless his children. May he open up our hearts to truth. May we be willing to believe God, to humbly bow a knee and say, God, I need help. Cast your care upon him. Jeremiah later on says, cast all your care upon him because he careth for you. Call unto me, he says, and I will answer thee. Show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Peter himself said, God cares for us. He's going to meet our needs. So tonight, I'm not just talking name it, claim it here. I'm talking about the principles of God's word. Right. Daniel's den of prayer changed his life, helped his nation, and did wonders for the things of God. Your needs tonight, your situation tonight, take it to the Lord. Give it to him and trust and do not be afraid. Lean not in your own understanding. All that was acknowledge him and let him direct your paths. And just like this morning, you'll have an experience worth talking about. Amen. When the prayers are answered, well, glory to God for his goodness to the children of men. Amen. Whatever your need is tonight, whatever your concern is tonight, we know who we should talk to. Right. Let's regard him properly and bow the knee and expect the blessings of God.